think of modern Indian painters and her name is amongst the first to come to mind. Attend an auction and her paintings are amongst the first to sell. She's liked by the critics, she's loved by art lovers and she's a favourite of the fashionable set. But what sort of person lies behind the artist and how does she regard her work? To find out, keep watching as I talk to Anjali Ella Menon. Anjali, you've had perhaps more acclaim than most other Indian artists. Is this recognition a source of satisfaction or is it irrelevant to you as an artist? Well, it's been a source of surprise. I, I never <laughs> could imagine. I, never, I wasn't particularly ambitious. I certainly didn't want to become well-known or famous. I just wanted to paint. And uh, so it's always, it continues to be a surprise, uh, even to hear words like yours. Okay, when you uh, paint, who do you paint for yourself, for an audience? Absolutely, absolutely for myself. And finally, after many, many years, uh, I have a studio of my own where I can go and be myself and paint only for myself. So the painting world is your own inner sanctum? Absolutely, yes. But tell me something, this means that paintings, though exhibited publicly, mm. remain actually a very private, personal expression. Well, I've always said this. I've said that I've said that the act of painting is is a completely personal and I, I admit a selfish one. I don't. Uh, that's why I, I don't believe in didactic art. I don't paint uh, pictures for causes or uh, uh, ideas. Uh, it is completely a form of self-expression. It's done by myself for myself. The fact that it's so many other things happen to a painting afterwards uh, continues to. Uh, baffle one and uh, some, sometimes irritate one too. The fact that it's then framed, uh, hung, bought, sold, criticized, uh, interpreted in various ways, uh, which is very far from, sometimes very far from uh, uh, where it was painted. Okay, you say you paint for yourself, so let's try and understand you. Your father was a Bengali general, your mother had a Brahmo Samaj background, your grandmother was American Christian. Are you a child of two worlds? I'm not only a child of two worlds, but I'm a child, uh, a, a person of many worlds. And I think uh, in this uh, day and age, I'm very, very happy and glad about that. I think I'm terribly fortunate to have had uh, both Western and um, uh, Indian upbringing uh, with Western classical music and, and uh, literature, as well as uh, the Indian um, traditional ba background that my father was able to impart. It, it sounds very privileged. Was it also a wealthy family? No, no. We had no money at all. <laughs> so were you scratching around for a living? Was it no, precarious? No, Like all army uh, families, uh, we never heard about money. We never thought about money. It wasn't uh, a subject that was ever mentioned. Uh, the life in the cantonment was so complete, uh, you never needed any money. Okay, you lost your mother when you were very young. Very young, yes. Was that traumatic? Yes. That was very traumatic. But it also was a catalyst that um, I poured my grief of that time really into starting to paint. And uh, it was the catalyst that made me decide not to be a doctor as my father wanted and to want to be a painter. Do you even suggest that if that hadn't happened, perhaps you might have ended up a doctor, not I a painter? I might have. I might have. But I was also encouraged very much and brought up thereafter by my two aunts. Uh, Tara Ali Beg was one of them. And I was very pri privileged to have been brought up by her and by my gra American grandmother. How do you remember your American grandmother? Because she played quite a seminal role in yes, your upbringing. Yes, she did, especially since my mother died young. Well, she was just, um, what I'm trying to be a grandmother like that to my grandchildren too. Just to be there, uh, to be very, very loving, uh, to cook wonderful meals, and to provide that kind of stability. That, she gave uh, you the emotional backbone that Absolutely. losing a mother would otherwise yes, have meant you yes, wouldn't have had. Yes. Okay, you first began painting seriously at the age of 12 at Lovedale School. Yes, I'd already started to paint, but I really painted very, very seriously and outpourings of hundreds of paintings. I mean, the output at that time was amazing, just after my mother died, which was uh, when I was just around 14. You had yeah. a school art master, Shashil Mukherjee, who I believe was amongst the first to recognize and draw out your talent. How important was he looking back now? He was very, very important. In fact, uh, I've been very bereft because he died last year. And I kept up with him, though he did migrated to America. I saw him many times, and he continued to be a source of inspiration. Did he approve of the way Anjali Ella Menon had developed from the age of 12 to the artist she is today? Well, I think that he, uh, like me, was a little bit surprised at, at the, the accolades and the so-called fame, and he always cautioned me about it. And he said, you know, you've got to keep your, the core of your creativity very, very pure and not get shaken by all this. He remained a steadying influence and in case the praise turned your head. He did. It's not just turned my head, but he said that the praise is ephemeral. 
both praise and blame are eph ephemeral, but the work remains and your work has got to uh, continue to have quality. Uh, don't ever get shaken by uh, wanting to do quickies and so on. You know? In the 1960s, mm. you went to Paris and studied for two years at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Who mm. was that like? Well, I think it was a very, very necessary experience in my life. Uh, more than what we did at the Bazaar, it was an opening up uh, of the mind because um, when I left uh, India, I'd already had two exhibitions. Uh, I'd already become the darling of Delhi and Bombay society, uh, which was extremely bad for me at that age. I was about 18, uh, 18 and a half. I'd already had these exhibitions. Uh, Richard Bartholomew had written glowingly about me in thought and other critics had taken that up. When I went to Paris, the first thing was it was a big come down. Um, I was just uh, you were nobody down. there. I was nobody there, and the people, uh, the other people who were there, also on scholarships, they were the creme de la creme of the brains of the world, and I f f found huge gaps in my knowledge. Uh, certainly, the whole French side was missing. I hadn't read Proust. I hadn't. I just barely read Camus. Uh, I hadn't. Um, I hadn't seen uh, the great films. Uh, so I joined the Cinematheque uh, with another friend, Alain Pettit. I gathered at one stage you saw as many as 90 films in That's a semester. Right. In one uh, in one month. 90 films in a month. Because they used to have three films a day. And since we paid a lot, so during our holidays, we'd really saved and saved on, on a very, uh, it was a very stingy bourse that we used to get. So you were uh, absorbing Western culture like a sponge you were taking it in. Absolutely, absolutely. And then we traveled, for knowledge. Uh, this friend of mine, Shama Zaidi, uh, Shama and I hitchhiked and backpacked throughout Europe. Uh, through uh, the Middle East as well, which people had said was fraught with danger, but nothing ever happened. So this was really the learning experience that was, made the Anjali Menon of today. It was a very great uh, learning experience, and uh, uh, a lot of what I saw then, especially in Romanesque and Byzantine art, uh, formed the sort of bed, the visual bedrock of uh, my whole uh, the the genre which I then created. Okay, you came back and married in December 1962 to Raja Menon. Can I? Describe him as a childhood sweetheart? Yes, we were in Lovedale together. We were in So from the age of 12, you decided Raja no, no, was going to be your man? No, I hated him when we were here. <laughs> I was 12. I hated him when I was 12. He used to spit uh, little paper balls at the back of my head in class. <laughs> he was a big tease. He was a big tease. And, but by the time I was 14, I think I was, I was very sure I was. What won you over? I don't know. He was just a charisma. I think he, he was. He was exceedingly intelligent, even then. Uh, and I still continue to think that he's the most intelligent man I know. But your parents didn't share your admiration for him, did they? I gather they were trying very hard to put you off marrying him once upon a time. <laughs> yes, my father did, yes. He said because he was a, such a young punk. <laughs> and he was too young, really. He didn't really object to him. But in the end, my father doted on him. And that was nice. Marriage to Raja, of course, also turned you into a naval officer's wife. Yes. How difficult was it to be a naval officer's wife and an artist at the same time? Well, when I look back on it now, 30 years of moving 30 times, uh, constantly... So there was no such thing as a permanent home? There was no such thing as a permanent home. We were constant nomads. In, in, in a way, it, it was, they were all great experiences. And I can't say I have any regrets. But it was difficult, and it grew increasingly more difficult as I grew older, to lead both lives. Uh, there's a little quote at the back of, of the book that was done on me, in, in which it said, and in this pandemonium, uh, I can, in the hinterland of this pandemonium, I live alone. Your and friends say that Anjali Menon learned to become two different split personalities. On the one hand, there was the moody, introspective, melancholic painter. On the other, there was the gregarious, fun-loving mother and wife. Yes, it had to be like that. But I find that it's more and more difficult now to play both roles. So which one are you choosing now? It's not a question of choosing. One has to, I think when one chose marriage, a lot of my friends who were in Paris said, marrying, I mean, how can you do a thing like marrying? It's such a prosaic thing to do. And how can you be a painter and marry? And you've got to stay on in Paris and lead the bohemian life. But the lure of Raja, just Raja as a person, was just too strong, not marriage. Uh, as, and it happened that he, because he was in the services, I couldn't uh, exactly choose to live with him. So today, so which would you him. call yourself? A painter, a mother, a wife? A grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> a, a grandmother who paints. <laughs> a grandmother who paints. No, no, but seriously, I do. I drag my grandchild along with me to my studio, and she and I paint together. But what about know. earlier on, before you had grandchildren? Mm. How easy was it to it find the easy. space? It was very difficult. It was very difficult to find the space to paint. For many years, I I didn't even have the physical space to paint, leave alone the mental or emotional space to paint. 
Uh, I just painted in a little corner of the house. It was always my corner that was uh, swept aside when there was a guest. How did you tell your husband and your children that this yeah. is my world, you can't walk into it? Well, they did. I mean, you know, I never managed to tell them that. I haven't managed to convince them about that even till today. Uh, in fact, uh, I was relating an amusing incident where I was painting this huge mural which is now at the uh, Indira Gandhi International Airport. Uh, and it was being painted on panels on the floor. And I came in uh, in the evening where the painting was drying and found these huge Nike marks all over it. But my friend, my son had shown his pals that, look, my mother's painting this painting and they walked right all over it. And so, so, so presumably yeah. some of the best of Anjali Menon has been touched, perhaps deliberately, perhaps unintendedly, yeah. by her husband and children. Absolutely. Not so much by my husband. I think he's a little more discreet about it. But the kids, certainly, if you ask them about my painting, I mean, they think that I've always painted... Uh, with, I mean, I've always lived with a spoon in one, a ladle in one hand and a brush in the other. And uh, today... Nothing the, changes. And today <laughs> but at the, least I have a hideaway now. I have a place to get away to. So when I'm there, uh, they don't come. But today, now that they've grown up and that they know that you're a mm. very highly acclaimed painter, are they proud of Mummy? I think you'll have to ask them that. I'm not sure. Why well, that's the point at which you're embarrassed. You know, in, uh, no, in uh, Hindi we have this uh, expression, ghar ki murgi dal barabar which means that if you have a chicken at home, it's just like eating lentils. So I think it's a bit like that. So I they're not impressed by mummy's acclaim at all? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, Anthony, yeah. we're going to take a quick little break over there. I want to come back in part two and talk to you about your work and how you regard it. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. See you then. Welcome back to Face to Face. My guest is Anjali Ella Menon. Anjali, let's talk a little about your paintings. They say that an Anjali Ella Menon work is unclassifiable, that you don't belong to any particular school of painting. Does that make you an individual or does that make you a maverick? Well, both really. Both. You've often used the description maverick to describe yourself. Why do you choose that? Because I seem to have always done uh, uh, the wrong thing at the wrong time or, or maybe the right thing at the wrong time. Uh, when the whole world was going abstract, um, I continued to be resolutely figurative. Uh, in my approach to art. When uh, people were painting didactic paintings, uh, mine continued to be uh, very um, uh, personal and uh, perhaps a bit escapist. Uh, when everyone was coming back to figurative art, I had my first foray into abstraction. But was uh, this the way things simply turned out or was this deliberate? No, it was just the way things turned out because I was not really very concerned with with trends and schools and, and where I belonged, uh, as I say, because I painted for myself. So if there's a pattern in your paintings, mm. it's one that happens to have crept in because you wanted it. It's not something deliberate, it's not something you were striving for. It's always been like that. In fact, many of the paintings just make themselves as you're painting them. I, I don't necessarily approach the canvas with any preconceived notion and yet of how it's going to turn out. And yet there are certain distinct Anjali Menon features that people notice. For instance, Symbols such as the crow, the lizard, an empty chair, a kite. What do those mean? Well, it's that uh, I think as a woman painter particularly, one's world is, is very small. And uh, one of the things that painters do, I think, or any artist or even writers do, is to take uh, mundane, ordinary objects and uh, by repetition, by recognizing them, by picking the crow from the windowsill onto the canvas, you are making a symbol. Uh, out of him. What becomes a motive by repetition then becomes a symbol. And uh, uh, for instance, the chair. The chair has been a very important uh, object in, in my work. And to a certain extent, the chair was symbolic, uh, especially the empty chair. Uh, again, denoting that someone had been there. The, my work's always been related to people. So the chair denoted someone who had been, perhaps gone away. Uh, let me, let me ask you this. Mm. You said that you were a child of two worlds and that there's as much of you that's Indian as there is Western. Mm. Would you call your paintings particularly Indian? Well, there was one phase. I, I don't think one can, especially when you've done 42 years of painting, you can't classify your paintings in, in one category. And there were certainly, uh, my earlier work was very Westernized. It was sometimes criticized for being very Western. Uh, but certainly, uh, since my marriage to Raja and my, my interaction with uh, my uh, in-laws in Kerala, uh, a lot of uh, Kerala themes have come into my work. 
um, in the last, I would say, 15 years. And it's also true that in the early 80s, when your husband was posted in Germany and you went there with him, mm. you found that you were unable to draw and paint in Germany. Your completely, muse dried up, you completely. said. Completely. I mean, I used to sit there in front of this blank canvas for days on end. And finally, I told Raja, I said, just give me a ticket. I want to go home. Well, what was the problem? Was I don't Germany know. too comfortable to I understand? I just cannot understand what it was. And when the muse deserts you, it just deserts you. And, and it's, that is the greatest despair for an artist. And yet you stepped off the plane and you painted non-stop for a month on yes, return to Yes, I India. went to my friend Preeti's house, uh, who, where I used to always keep canvases uh, and paint under her bed. And uh, I just came from the airport to her house at 3 in the morning and I started to paint. And I just didn't stop. I painted 20 paintings in a month. So do you need the sight smells, the traumas and troubles in <laughs> India? Well, traumas and troubles is putting it a little... That's sights um, and smells? It's just that this is home and um, I can't analyze why uh, I need to be here. And I need also, I, I very much thrive uh, in an urban setting. Uh, I'm not one for idyllic places away in the country, away from You said from earlier on that your mother's death was a catalyst that propelled you into painting. Do you draw from pain? Do you draw from experience and suffering? I don't think I draw from experience or suffering, but I think that anyone who lives in this country and is in the least bit sensitive, uh, the experience, uh, the suffering uh, has to show itself. show itself or overlap into your work at some stage. When I look at an Anjali Menon painting, mm -hmm. say of the 60s and 70s, the eyes are hooded, the colours are sombre, and the image that comes to mind is one of melancholy, of introspection, and a certain deliberate holding back, as if there's a secret that the painter is retaining. Would you accept that? Perhaps, perhaps, yes. And yet, when you look at some of your more recent work, the eyes have opened, the colours are more vivid. Is that just a change in style of painting, or is that also reflective of a change in you, your personality? No, of course, I think it does always reflect one's personality in one's circumstances. When circumstances change and uh, you go through periods of, of joy and happiness and certainly by, by the time you come to my age there is and I have been very fulfilled. A great fulfillment in one's life, in one's uh, aims and in one's family uh, and the way one lives. And so in a sense would you say that your paintings when seen as a whole plot a sort of autobiography? I haven't really thought of it as such but perhaps yes. There was a period uh, where I was very, very lonely. And uh, this was not because my world was not peopled. It was, it, in fact, it coincided with the, with the stage when my children were growing up and there was a lot going on. And uh, Rajas continued to be very close. And, what and was the cause friend. of the loneliness? Did you suddenly feel that you didn't have a role in the family? The kids had grown up? No, 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 it wasn't. It job. was even before the kids had grown up. Uh, it was just, I think there's a loneliness in one's, one's inner quest and one's inner journey uh, as a painter. Uh, which comes, to, sometimes you come to a dead end, sometimes uh, you don't know where your work is going. And that loneliness which you felt inside you, you expressed through your paintings? No, it's that the paintings uh, are uh, an expression of those, of that loneliness. Uh, it's not that the, uh, that the loneliness is, is a sewage by the, the, the fact of painting. Um, I think that you always have to struggle alone. The struggle of the artist, no one can share. Not your friends, not your family, not your mentors, not your teachers, your gurus. If, if you've got to get there, you've got to struggle, you know. If the struggle of an artist cannot mm. be shared, mm. then let me ask you this. Is an Anjali Ella Menon painting simply a visual experience? Or is it also something that has to be understood cerebrally? Do you need to understand it with the brain or do you need to just admire it with the eyes? Well, I hope uh, that one goes beyond uh, what somebody had, had uh, described as a surface allure uh, because there is a, a, there's an alluring technique uh, which over the years gets perfected, a sort of renaissance hue uh, which is pleasing. But uh, I think that I in many phases of my work there's been an underlying hint of menace. There has been, uh, as you have said, an underlying um, sorrow or, or grief which has often been manifest. And that's difficult for people to um, to just mm, gloss over. But in, so in fact, many of uh, I think one of my, my the, some of the most rewarding moments uh, in my life as a painter have been when people have identified uh, totally with some painting of mine. Uh, a woman who's come to the gallery and said, "That's my chair. That's or that's me sitting in that chair." 
uh, there has been a sense of identification with many of the people who see the paintings. I, how often do you find people who come and actually understand from the painting what you were trying to express through it? Very seldom what I was trying to express, but many people use the painting as a vehicle for their own expression. And that's rewarding too. Because you've helped draw out from them yes. what they perhaps haven't been able to express for themselves. Yes, that, that often happens when you read a good book. But you then you become know. a catalyst for their emotions. Yes, yes, quite often. But then isn't that unsatisfying for you? Because your paintings are an expression of something you're trying to say. And if people don't readily understand it, do you feel It doesn't down? matter to me because the satisfaction for me is only in making the painting. And when that painting is made, for me, the experience is over, really. Uh, I know a lot of people feel that uh, one is so interested in what happens to the painting afterwards. Do you not care at all? Not very much, not very much. Otherwise, I think I would have been much more careful with my documentation, much more careful about where my paintings went. Uh, I, do try and, uh, I do try very consciously to uh, achieve a certain detachment. So each painting, when it's finished, mm. is a chapter that's over? It is, because only then you can go forward. You can't uh, keep harking back to what you have So does it not behind. matter to you whether a painting has a good home, whether it fetches a good price? Like a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. And is parting with these works of art when you're finished with them because they're expressions of your soul in a sense difficult? Yeah. It used to be very difficult when I was younger. I remember my father used to happily give away my paintings to all his pals. Say, oh, my daughter will paint some more. You can have this painting or that. So I find in some old general's house a very early painting uh, hanging on his wall, um, all my father's old cronies. But uh, I used to find that hard. But I grew out of it and very deliberately. Uh, I, I think it's very important not to get attached. All artists retain some of their paintings for themselves, but I've noticed from the book that's been mm. done on you mm. that some of the most striking have been kept at home. A few. A few have been kept. So you so that's, the, that's my children more than me, who said, no, 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 you're not going to part with that. Yeah. You don't have your own favorites? I don't. I think you get, just get used to things that are on your wall. So to that extent, they become favorites. And now um, that you're... They're more familiar than favorites. So. And now that you're mm. a grandmother, yes. you've achieved a terrific renown in India and abroad as a painter. What's the next ambition? What's the next goal? Well, sometimes I just long for some ordinariness. I really do. Uh, what does ordinariness mean to you? To not be in the, the public eye, uh, to not have one's paintings on the market, um, just to be left alone. You want to be other than yourself? Yes. No, to just be myself. <laughs> to be yourself. <laughs> yes. Without someone pointing it out to you all the time. <laughs> yes. Angelina Menon, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.